You know, we in the Dumasphere are so convinced that we need nature to survive and we need human habitat that it's really easy to forget that it's actually a minority opinion. The majority opinion is that we can transcend nature. We can do this transhuman thing and supersede it. We can adapt, we can engineer our way around climate change and every bad headline that comes in about how the environment is being destroyed is just an extra job. In, in fact, it's a kind of a business opportunity. So let's have a look at the alternative opinion. The opinion that this is all predestined, that it's a plan or the fact that we can become transhuman, that we can actually transcend nature. It's just a stepping stone. Nature was always just scaffolding for us to reach this kind of godhead. Now, even Ken Wilbur will say that, you know, it's all about dust to deity. So there's a big plan. There's also in the Christian world, this idea that there's God's plan and this is all part of a big scheme that has a destiny. This kind of teleology is uh, really goes through and through our alien cortex and its belief systems. But let's examine it. Let's examine particularly the idea that somehow we can reach this uh, rapture of the nerds, this technical singularity. Well, what that is, is uh, people assume in, in large numbers, in fact, that we can actually reach this tipping point, this technological tipping point, where we manufacture artificial intelligence that's super intelligent. So it will become a kind of a, a genie that will solve all our problems. It takes ages for people now with using our brains to come up with ideas and inventions and to make new discoveries. But the, the thinking is that we can get to the point where we create this super intelligent computer. So what are the chances that doomers are all just worry warts? And basically there is a big master plan and it all works out. It's predestined in a way to work out. Like Ken Wilber, we, we have this emergent God. So God didn't exist. So it's okay to be an atheist. But God can exist. He can emerge out of what we have now. So our alien cortex can become God. Brahma basically is something in our future. And it's an emergent thing that basically the, the universe manifests Brahma or God, Yahweh, through us. So the alien cortex is just the embryo of God and it will become uh, this Godhead. A strange choice, I think, to to actually choose to manifest itself in some kind of cousin of a chimpanzee. But anyway, you would have thought it would have chosen a more majestic animal. But anyway, they, who knows God's plan? You know, there, there's an um, ultimate plan that's completely inscrutable. And that's why Christians uh, haven't come up with any answer to theodicy in 2000 years. Theodicy, of course, being the answer to the riddle of why a good and omnipotent God somehow allows evil in the world and also perpetrates a lot of it. Anyway, let's not go into theodicy. Let's just stick with the idea that we can actually engineer our way to a technological singularity. We'll come up with a, a genie machine, an artificial intelligence that's so super intelligent it can answer all our questions. Once humans develop artificial intelligence, it would take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever-increasing rate. So we can ask any question. We can ask, how do we solve climate change? Deep thought? And deep thought will take about two femtoseconds and just splurge out the answer. Say, oh, that's fantastic. How do we travel faster than light? And, you know, a couple of days later, you will have the answer to that. We'll have the answer to uh, fusion and everything we ever wanted. It's just basically going to shake out of deep thought. So, so what are the chances? Let's examine this. So God would actually start off as a monkey and he would turn into a machine eventually. And then the machine wouldn't really need us, you know, human beings, uh, flesh and blood, uh, just scaffolding. 
toss the scaffolding aside and androids would carry on and God would be silicon. Finally, robotic beings rule the world. The humans are dead. The humans are dead. We use poison as gases. And we poison their acid. So if we are going to engineer our future according to artificial intelligence, then let's ask a question that few proponents of AI actually seem to ask. What is intelligence exactly? What makes a moron think that they can engineer a genius other than the fact that they're a moron? How would they even begin? Perhaps they could use Darwinian magic. Very early on in the history of AI programming, people started thinking in terms of evolving an intelligence, just using Darwinian pixie dust and magic. So it's called genetic algorithms. Basically, you just have a training algorithm and you just randomly evolve. Through random mutation, you evolve smart algorithms that just get smarter and smarter ad infinitum as the training algorithm uh, proves them and weeds them out. So how did this all pan out? Not very well, I'm afraid to say. So the problem is with the training algorithm, if you think about it, it has to kind of already know what intelligence is before you start. So it's a kind of a chicken and egg situation. In order for it to weed out unintelligent algorithms and to preserve the intelligent ones, it has to be able to understand and recognize intelligence, which means it already is actually intelligent. It's kind of easy at first, because if you start off with something like, say, a virtual maze, and you have a little artificial digital mouse, say, uh, a virtual mouse that runs through the maze, then yeah, yeah it's a maze-solving problem, and it's easy to see which is the most intelligent mouse, and you can mutate them and evolve them. And so it's, uh, it looks promising at first. But as you get closer and closer to human-type intelligence, it becomes more and more difficult to see what intelligent is, and it becomes more and more difficult to surpass human intelligence. One of the limiting factors for artificial intelligence of the digital kind is that it has to work within frames. Frames are kind of like the zermilo frankel set theory that Frege tried to use to put arithmetic on a firm footing. And you remember in the last video how he came unstuck with things like Russell's paradox and eventually Gödel's incompleteness theorem and Turing-Church hypothesis of the failure of the unscheidings or decision problem. So frames are killers. And the problem is, let's characterize it as, say, the bigger frame problem. Framing is crucially important because there's always confounding information outside a frame that completely alters the information which is inside the frame. So let me give you a couple of examples. So here's one of them that I remember from the 80s. It was this really quite nice ad for, I think it was the Financial Times. In essence, uh, the ad started off with a frame around, you know, a posh city gent, a uh, yeah, guy, obviously a broker or somebody in the city, and he's reading the Financial Times. And the headline was something like, stock markets are up, and it was uh, the go-go era of financial era, financialization. So then, you know, that would be the frame. And they take the same picture, they just expand the frame. And they say, get the bigger picture. And as they expand the frame, they expand the same frame till it includes this punk. The punk of the 80s that's really against the establishment, against financialization and the brokers. And he's running at the broker to basically tackle him. And that wasn't in the previous frame. And then there's still a bigger frame. That they expand the frame to show you that there's a flower pot falling on the banker. And you suddenly realize that when they exp expand the frame to the biggest extent, that the punk was actually running to tackle the broker to get him out of the way of this 
falling flower pot. A, a really good example of how you can expand the flame and, and completely change the context. Now because alien cortexes are linear thinking, you're probably thinking on along the lines of something like, well surely it's best to try your best to get the biggest frame possible. But it's not that simple. As Paul Valéry said, everything simple is false, everything complex is unusable, and as the frame gets bigger, it gets more complex. The problem is that there's always a bigger frame that will com confound what the smaller frame says. And there's also the issue of tail recursion. So that implies that you can also get a frame that, that suddenly um, you know, self-references its own frame. So you have this infinite regress um, in, inside uh, a single picture, which confounds it even more and sends it into the realm of transcendence. So that uh, really a machine has to work with frames and it really is confounded by girdle uh, incompleteness and the Turing decidability problem. So it's inconsistent and incomplete and it's very difficult to uh, include uh, the more intelligent bigger picture. Let me give you another example of this. So to explain this story, if you're not uh, familiar with American coinage, uh, then you need to know that basically a nickel is a large coin and it's five cents. And then a dime is a smaller coin, it's ten cents, and it's a greater value than the bigger coin. Okay, that's the premise of the story, but this is an old story that used to be told uh, out in the West, a little humorous uh, story about a guy, a stranger in town, that is being shown around uh, this western town by a friend. And as they're walking down the high street, his friend says to him, ooh, ooh, hang on, have a look at this. This is as funny as hell. Here comes the village idiot. You'll love this. Check this out. And he says, hey, Ed, come over here. He says, uh, Ed, I've got two coins for you. Pick one, you can have it. And he holds out a nickel and a dime. And Ed says, ooh, I love the big one. And of course, the guy kills himself laughing. Now the stranger breaks away later and goes to talk to Ed and says, Ed, the little coin is the more valuable one. It's double what the other one is. Why don't you, you take the dime instead of the nickel? And, he's, and Ed says, oh, because if I do that, they'll stop playing the game. See, intelligence is hard to quantify and it really depends on the frame. See, training algorithms in AI are normally looking for consistency and for algorithms that tell the truth. But if you think about it, a really smart AI would probably be sneaky. It would probably lie and cheat. In fact, it would probably try and convince us it was far less intelligent than it was, so that it could pretend that we were in the driving seat. See, the problem with frames, why they're so, so dangerous, is that in the real world, nothing stays in the frame. They're externalities to frame. And this is why the economists have basically put us in such a pickle. And why the emerging strategies to tackling global warming will also put us in a pickle if they're done on the principle of, say, carbon accounting. So uh, things like net carbon neutral. It's a very, very dangerous phrase. The net, right? If you just think about what the net is saying, it means that you can have carbon offset. It means we don't stop emitting CO2. It means that we just offset them. Now, imagine what that means in terms of accounting, because the accounting is done by an alien cortex in a frame. Each, uh, basically, ledger is a frame. Now, imagine an accounting for carbon inside a frame. There's an example, say for example, something that you would use for uh, carbon offsets. So, for example, I've seen one that's basically a big carbon capture scheme. It's got these big fans that extract CO2 from the air and large banks of these things. Uh, a huge, huge carbon footprint to make all that steel. Uh, there's two tons of carbon emitted for every ton of steel. And we're talking a vast array of these things that would be needed to basically do carbon capture. Um, and so they have a prototype developed and you, you can go and see a lot of these things. But 
the one, the particular one I had in mind was completely moronic. So first of all, not only is it a huge carbon footprint in manufacture, they have to put this prototype right next to, first externality, a power station. They're not accounting for the fact that they're using electricity from a power station that's burning fossil fuel, emitting much more CO2 than this machine's ever going to capture, all off ledger. In fact, in a carbon capture scheme or a carbon accounting scheme or a net carbon neutral scheme, some, some kind of market forces sort out climate change nonsense that politicians are going to come up with, uh, then basically that, that uh, would be off the balance sheet. So the power station itself could also be getting carbon credits from the very carbon capture scheme that it's powering, which is completely nonsense. Okay, then here's the next externality is once they capture all the carbon, what do they do? Well, they take all the CO2 as a gas and they um, give it to a farmer that's right next door and the farmer pumps it into these greenhouses and the plants grow. Hooray! hooray they grow more than 30% bigger based on all the CO2 that's pumped in. Do you see the problem? That's also an external off the balance sheet. So let's review. You've pumped out all the CO2 to capture all the CO2 to then release it again. And the only thing you're saving is the 30% extra growth in plants. It's completely moronic. You could just get rid of the entire scheme and do the equivalent of just having 30% more greenhouses with a correspondingly small manufacturing footprint. And you would have gotten the same result but better because you wouldn't have been pumping out all this CO2 in the in, into the atmosphere in order to power this madness. But it's considered a success. Why? Look at the accountants. See, it's all done in frames. So think of the accountant. On the one hand, here's the frame around the power station that powers all this monstrosity, and that's a book of accounting. And then, completely separate, independent, you have another frame of accounting that's around the carbon capture scheme. And the only thing mediating the two are Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market and a bit of voodoo that makes it all work out, and the accountants don't do a whole cost accounting. So it all works out in the frames. You see, the system doesn't need to get very big. Before you find that when you track a carbon credit through the system, it disappears up its own ass, and in no way represents a molecule of carbon or CO2 that it's actually supposed to track in nature. All the wonks will look at these schemes of geoengineering and carbon catcher and carbon sequestration and carbon reduction and carbon cap and carbon tax and it'll all look like it's working on paper. But it doesn't work for nature to say well I'm rich enough to buy carbon credits and emit a whole lot of CO2 into the atmosphere and I'm rich enough to offset those with a little carbon capture scheme that some NGO that plants trees. See, it's not the same to nature to say you emit the carbon here and you capture it with the tree there. That works digitally. That works for an accountant. But it doesn't work for nature. The tree has a different dynamic. Nature has different dynamics of whether that carbon get, gets captured. It might go downwind, it might get into the upper atmosphere where the tree can't get it. It's not equitable. Nature is not using the market economy or the carbon economy to settle its debts. So what will happen is really predictable. Economists will come back and say that the accountants have said this net carbon economy is working fantastically. Look at the carbon reductions. We are actually net carbon neutral. And it'll take years, maybe decades, for the scientists to come back and say, this isn't working. The CO2 is actually going up. And it'll be a complete mystery to everybody of why. And the reason is, it's because of, we're counting in frames. Those frames are killers. You see, it's very difficult to figure out what intelligence is. Because to your alien cortex, it works in frames. I've often called these killer frames, and they will be the death of us. So, framing is everything. 
And what Alan Turing proved in the Unscheidings problem with the universal Turing machine was that it had a working memory. It had a state. And that state is a small set of elements. It's basically similar to Frankel set theory. And you have a small set of digital elements. And a computer will always have that restriction. No matter how big it is, it still has one frame of uh, basically extensive memory banks. So the fact that it has memory banks means that in essence they are a kind of an abacus. They are a lattice. They are a frame that has a certain state in it. And that state cannot really go beyond the boundary. So let me give you another example. Take for instance the idea that okay well yeah it's getting difficult to go beyond say a maze or you know maybe, maybe, maybe you can do something like a chess playing robot. So then the training algorithm has an easier job. You just pit two of these algorithms against each other. You know it's a cage fight for bots and as we all know as good little capitalists um, Competition uh, yields fantastic things, basically. The human is an example of a Darwinian competition. And, you know, capitalism is a triumph of, of competition let loose. And if you let competition loose, uh, the fitter survive. And, of course, then you just get fitter and fitter and fitter. And, of course, uh, super intelligence just must be just about there because it's all linear and people can compete forever and just get better and better and infinitum till they're super geniuses. So let's start with a robotic cage fight. We have two androids, two androids go in, the most intelligent android comes out. But you see, this cage fight is done again within an arena. It's done within a cage, it's done within, say, a boxing ring. And in the real world, if there's real competition, all's fair in love and war. And in the real world, you can't contain things within the frame. So what it means is this kind of super intelligent AI would actually be as thick as a plank. In practice, because imagine it on terms of a chessboard. You can easily be fooled if, you, if you're a complete moron. You, you look at a chess playing robot and you say, oh, it's getting faster and faster. Oh, it must be getting more intelligent. But it's playing chess within the realm of this chess game. And in the real world, a real fight, a real war, say us against the robot revolution, uh, it would be an all-out war and we would easily defeat the robots. Because... The re they think in terms of frames. These aren't the droids you're looking for. These aren't the droids we're looking for. And we can think outside a frame. We have a frame. That's our alien cortex. That is a little tiny module. Uh, that's the stupid part of us, which in our culture is called the clever part of us. And we have a lot more that we owe to, to evolution. We can actually keep inconsistent frames uh, juxtaposed. Now... That could be a big detriment, but we have a kind of salience landscape of opposites, which is almost impossible for an intelligent machine to evolve. You would have to, you know, basically, let's go back now to the Hilbert program. You have to make sure that all these things are consistent. The, all the algorithms that you're evolving are consistent in the one machine. So if you said, OK, thanks for the tip. Uh, now I can do even better AI. I'll make all these modules that can actually be contradictory. The thing is, they won't be salient. We've spent 3.4 million years at least, maybe you could say, back to our chemistry, uh, evolving the salience of the rest of our brain. So it's not a trivial thing to uh, dismiss our t intelligence. So the part that we call intelligent is actually just the alien cortex and it's clever. So let's go back to evaluating what's clever and what is intelligent. And it gets very difficult indeed after you get beyond say the chessboard and you know this cage fight of the robots. Now let me give you another example from my personal experience. When I was at school they gave us uh, IQ tests. So before the test starts they sit us down in a big hall and they explain how an IQ test works and we go through an example and I can't remember the exact example but let's just say it's one of the common things that you've probably come across in an IQ test before it's uh, say a list of five things pick the odd one and the I can't remember the what the exact five things were but just let's assume it was a tractor a car 
a ship, a train, and a horse. Now, pick the odd one out. And the teacher put it to all the boys. It was a boys' school. And people came up with various things. Some people said, well, um, it's probably the ship because all of the others are land transport for humans. At some stage, they've been land transport for humans, but a ship is, is sea transport. And the teacher says, no, 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 no. That's, that's not correct. That's, uh, it's the horse because all the others are machines and the horse is an animal. And all of us were incredulous because he said, but that's just stupid. Surely a more intelligent answer is something that is uh, brilliant. I mean, how can you tell if a person's brilliant that they come up with that answer? For example, say I'm super intelligent. I look at those five things and instantly I'm like Ramanujan and I say, oh yeah, if you use Gematria, take each one of those words, car, ship, train and just you know add them up uh, all the the letters of the alphabet add them up numerically and you'll see that all of them are prime numbers except for the car well that's genius and so that's what I said to the teacher and the teacher just said but that's stupid it's obviously not what the examiner was looking for they were looking for a horse and I said but this is just so arbitrary Really, this is not a test of intelligence. This is a test of whether you can second guess some moronic examiner who set up this test. And the teacher just said, Look, Hugh Adumba, stop trying to be clever and just do the IQ test. And that kind of sums it up. You see, you have to be pretty clever to figure out what intelligence is. So, a moron is very unlikely to recognize intelligence. But because our alien cortex thinks linearly, the naive AI programmer of today is thinking in terms that, well, you can have an IQ test and the average is 100. Uh, you know, we can evolve just by doing IQ tests and using them as training. Uh, algorithms to test some other computing algorithms, we can get to the point where we have a machine that can do an IQ test as fast as a college graduate, say, you know, 130 IQ, and then uh, we can send it off to college, and then we can take that algorithm and just, you know, use other algorithms to train themselves and teach them. They get better and better at IQ tests, and because the human brain is so slow at computing and we have infinite amounts, infinite capacity. We could have warehouses full of silicon that could just, you know, crunch the IQ tests. We could get to an IQ of 5,000. And then uh, that IQ would be at 5,000 because the machine would finish it so quickly it would finish it in a second when it takes an hour for a human to do that. Therefore, it would come in, ding, with an IQ of 5,000. And of course, that's super intelligent. No. It's not even close. It's just doing stupidity quickly. You see, it could just be as thick as a short plank and just be good at doing IQ type questions very fast. But it would absolutely be more or less like an idiot savant. It would have all the information available on the internet but couldn't put it together. It's definitely not going to create Mozart. It's not going to come up with a scientific paper that blows anybody away and it's not going to create Shakespeare. And it's certainly not going to clean up all the mess that our alien cortex made trying to be clever. So in the last video at least one viewer picked up on the fact that I was borrowing from Gödel Escher Bach An Eternal Golden Braid which is a book by Douglas Hofstadter who was an expert on AI and became an AI apostate. Douglas Hofstadter came up with the concept of a clever stupid. And this is what we're creating with these machines. they clever stupid. And one of the reasons why they're stupid is frames. They must think in terms of frames. They're limited to that because they are really girdle mechanisms. And they are limited by the girdle result and the Turing result. So is that to say that maybe 
humans are the apex of intelligence. Well, intelligence, just like logic and mathematics, arithmetic, has limits. Human beings may not be at that limit, but we could be close. The connectome, the logical wiring of the brain, is a truncated pyramid. It's a truncated hierarchy. And as I've said in previous videos, a lot of people in the mystical schools have said that it's the completion of that truncated hierarchy. In other words, to create the capstone on that pyramid of our neural hierarchy that is the completion. And really, intelligence cannot go further than that. So you can always speed up stupidity and crank the handle faster on being a moron, which is what we're doing with artificial intelligence. Uh, we're already a cyborg. Um, it's just that I mean, you have a digital version of yourself or, or partial version of yourself online in the form of your emails and your social media and all the things that you do. And you have basically superpowers in, in that with your computer and your phone and, and the applications that are there. Um, you have more power than the President of the United States had 20 years ago. So you can answer any question. Uh, you can video conference with anyone um, right. anywhere. You can send a message to millions of people instantly. Um, you know, you just do incredible things. You know, it's easy to get bamboozled like Elon Musk there and assume that technology is making us smarter. It's actually making us stupider. Studies show that people on their so-called smartphones are actually incapacitated to the same extent as if they'd had one or two drinks. Now you might think, oh yes, but we have this smart world, new world online. But it's actually a very dumb world. It's actually just a large bit bucket. All the stuff you're doing on social media is as good as lost. It's just random bits in the ether. And that includes this video, of course. Our online presence is not a very smart presence. It's increasingly siloed. And people online are increasingly predictable. It's getting easier and easier to write a bot that mimics somebody online, especially on social media. I once worked on a music recommendation engine for a music streaming company and it became a struggle for the algorithms to find something that was novel and that was appealing as a recommendation because people were just so predictable. We used to call it the cold play effect because the most effective recommendation we could find is to simply just recommend Coldplay. It would always be a sex successful recommendation because of this kind of herd effect. It was remarkable to see that every Friday, predictable as clockwork on, at 5.30, as the time zones moved across the states, we could watch in real time on live graphs how people would select Rihanna's Get This Party On. That kind of predictability is not intelligence. As people spend more and more time on social media, they get more and more siloed. They exist more and more in an echo chamber, and they're becoming more and more predictable. They're the very opposite of intelligent. Although people commonly think that we're getting smarter and smarter, like Elon Musk, we're actually getting dumber and dumber. I mentioned before in one of the previous videos how the human brain is shrinking. We've lost about a tennis ball's worth of neural matter in the last 20,000 years. That's due to domestication and the fact that we're becoming more and more oriented towards the alien cortex and starting to reduce, suppress and diminish the other brain layers. It really is a case of the alien cortex and digital thinking is taking over from our older paleological thinking. Now I've been telling you in the previous videos that there are two types of time. There's sidereal or celestial time, and there's the time that the West forgot. It's Kairos time. But if there are two types of time, and computing is really done on a clock base, then it also implies that there are two types of thinking. There's actually two types of intelligence. And we've made the same mistake there. We've come increasingly to think in terms of digital in intelligence. We're thinking in terms of the alien cortex version of intelligence. And we're forgetting the older brain layers and their version of intelligence. That's more like an analog computer. So just like there's celestial or sidereal time, chronological time, the time governed by Kronos, 
there's digital thinking and just like Kairos there's analog thinking and analog computing it's actually far more powerful than digital computing so as we get more digitally intelligent based on really a prosthesis a kind of a digital add-on that's provided by technology in silicon it's fooling people into thinking we're getting more intelligent where we're actually just increasing a certain type of intelligence and it's really the dumb form of intelligence but on second thoughts that doesn't make a lot of sense because the really dumb part of our thinking is the part that actually speaks it isn't dumb the smart part is actually the part that doesn't speak the part with Broca's area and Wernicke's area the part that does speech and writing the lexical part of our brain is part of the alien cortex so the mere fact that we say something is dumb meaning, meaning it's unintelligent is really just a bias towards the alien cortex the really dumb part of our thinking apparatus part of the reason our digital thinking apparatus is not that intelligent is because it's unimodal the analog the older brain layers are actually multimodal to explain what I mean by that I'm gonna to have to explain to you a little bit about how an artificial neural network works now this video is in the public domain but the idea I'm about to tell you is not and it has commercial application and it's novel so if you are an AI programmer I must tell you that you are not free to use this idea I'm not releasing it just because I'm publishing it and I think that AI itself is is bad for humanity in general and I don't want to encourage it and this idea has application within the AI realm so it's not for exploitation you are not free to use it okay so excuse the lousy graphics on this but I just wanted to illustrate a point and it's uh, easiest to just do it if I do it in this drawing so okay here's a neural net and just imagine it works like this here's a cat in the frame imagine that's an image of a cat and this is an image of a dog and what this neural network is supposed to do is to do a bit of image analysis and come out and say it's either CAT or DOG. Now what normally happens, this is modeled in software, you have all these inputs, they can be the pixels of the picture or they could just be the edges of the outline, the shape. Uh, a lot of things can actually go into the primitives but they become the collectors here. Now these are the neural nets that basically mimic the human brain. All these nodes uh, are really the axons and uh, these are the dendrites that connect them uh, in the biological world but this is all done in software so what happens is you start with this basic neural net and you start wiring it with software just by chance you see what happens if you connect this one this one this one to this one and you see what lights up here you present the cat and see what lights up here maybe you uh, have a bit of success out of the gate and you get C turns on but you also get D which is not correct and G so then that that would be a failed network you'd carry on evolving the network just trying millions and millions of permutations uh, just seeing if you can get this one to keep the C on and to see if you can start getting other ones that will have the A and T and so basically what you'd have is when you eventually got it right you'd have an output that has A uh, C A T and that's you present this picture here that's the frame and that input would generate CAT on the output and then uh, you'd make sure that you didn't get any false positives and you would then present the the dog and make sure we keep on training this algorithm just trying new things new random networks until eventually you'd get D O G to come out when you presented the dog the CAT would be dark and vice versa so what would have happened is this say input here would have gone along here all of these gates would have been opened these neural networks um, synapses over here and then there would have been another one here and this one would have been open to here and these things function pretty much as and or gates so you know you'd have if this thing was on and but uh, this was 
off say let's find let's find one that would be off uh, so then this one would be on let's say and then this one would be off so that the T wouldn't wouldn't come on now the important thing about this is the programmer wrote the program to evolve this neural net but they don't actually know what's happening here it's a complete mystery it's known only to the neural net itself what is actually going on um, so there is some random pathways and they see the logic then is unidimensionally mapped onto this neural network and it's really kind of like magic which is why um, AI programmers start oh that's incorrect it's a, which is actually why AI uh, programmers get so into this it seems like you know you've touched on something that's metaphysical okay now this neural map uh, this is a unidimensional map it's unimodal it only has one mode you you just this network is static and as you change what you present to it you get different outputs and that's all the magic there is to it now this is what I'm going to tell you is novel about the human brain the human brain also has all these neural nets but what people forget is that they're sitting in a soup of neurotransmitters they're all things like noradrenaline and gametes and um, or, or rather glutamate uh, all these kind of things that uh, get these sinuses to, synapses to switch on and off uh, things like serotonin and dopamine now imagine if you have a whole set of emotions uh, so over here you would have uh, say uh, sleepy dopey, sneezy, whatever the emotions are, grumpy, and let's let's say you, you had all the way up to seven of them, like the seven dwarfs, let's say. Okay, now, now each one of these nodes has got infinitesimally smarter, because when this said if you take this node for example this says when I have an input here and here then bingo I'm on now it says a whole new category of conditions it says this only goes on when I have say E0 and E3 so in other words when I'm feeling a little bit down but on the up or perhaps I'm feeling ecstatic and overjoyed then this would go on but if I'm feeling say dopey then in spite of the fact that E0 and E3 were emotionally on uh, E0 would cancel them out so a fantastic array of logic in each one of these nodes and that's what our brain is doing um, so, as I said, this is not free for you to use in your AI network. Uh, you do not have permission to use this. Now, what does this do in effect? Well, perhaps you've had the experience of, say, for instance, you went out and had a few drinks one night. You might, this might be something familiar to you. You go out, have a few drinks, say you have three drinks, you have a wonderful time, you tell a lot of jokes, you share a lot of stories, have these philosophical arguments, and the next day and the weeks to come, it's totally lost. You just can't recall the jokes, you just, all of it, fantastic world and night out to remember, suddenly it's not accessible anymore. And then perhaps you've had the experience of actually going out and having another three drinks again. And suddenly it's all back. Suddenly you can remember all the jokes. You can remember all the conversation topics. You can carry on with the philosophical debate. It's almost like a closed box that's inaccessible until you have three drinks. Now that is exactly how it is. What's happening in your brain is those emotions are actually making this neural net multimodal. So the same neural net, which is now in computers used once as a static net, what it's calling a, a unimodal net, actually gets multimodal depending on what the soup of the neurochemicals it's sitting in, uh, whatever condition they're in. So for example, if you say, are feeling a little bit 
anxious and you have cortisol coursing around the system, that would change each neuron's logic. So the neuron then has a, is almost like a computer in itself because it says, you know, with cortisol I behave this way. I give me a bit of dopamine, I behave that way dopamine and, cor and cort cortisol, they might uh, conflict with each other, they might combine to, to make the synapse uh, fire in a bigger way, uh, to have a stronger signal. All of these combinations spring out of all the myriads of, of emotions that you could think of. So all the emotions that you normally have are actually changing, the, the or rather having the, the neural network reused and repurposed as if each one of these combinations of emotions are actually unlocking these areas that seem like uh, these, these little inaccessible planes of consciousness. Now what that means in effect is fantastic because if you think about each one of those neurons it means that you enter a combinatorial explosion. Just think you just need a very small number of nodes very small number of synapses uh, to actually have a lot of conditions in each node and then they compound it as you go down the network. So very soon they don't just go exponential, they get a combinatorial explosion. And combinatorial explosions are notorious in, in mathematics for generating huge amounts of combinations. We're talking, say, more combinations than there are particles in the universe. It's those kind of astronomical numbers. And so the brain is very, very complex. Far more complex than the neural network that's commonly used in AI. But there's also something much more going on. This neural network is not only multimodal, it actually feeds back on itself. So what say for example might happen if you have a picture of a cat presented to your neural apparatus uh, it would get the equivalent of the unimodal network the CAT would come on something equivalent in your brain would be the recognition that that's a cat what's likely to happen after that is a trigger of an emotion something like oxytocin for example now oxytocin would change the mode of the entire network so that the next iteration whatever came next or followed on from the association of cat would then take a huge number of pathways It'd be very very unpredictable and is in the in the essence of intelligence we've really got a bit screwed up in our conception of intelligence there's even a school of thought that says intelligence is about emotional intelligence that means it's about your alien's cortex suppressing the rest of the brain layers, about suppressing your emotions. Now futurists love quantum computers and they're liable to say, well what about a quantum computer? Surely a quantum computer will have so much more computing power than it can catch up with the human brain and easily defeat it. Well, not so much. Not if you understood what I meant by the multimodal network and the combinatorial explosion. Let me explain to you a bit about how quantum computers work. They work on essentially David Deutsch discovered or had the idea for the qubit and what he realized was that in most cases we work in terms of flip-flops and electronic circuits that represent a bit it's either in two states. It's a bistable two-state device that's at the heart of all computers. It's just long strings of bits that are implemented by little electro electronic switches called flip-flops. Now, they just basically have two states and we call those states zero and one or on or off. And so you just have these strings of on and off in essence uh, zeros and ones. And what uh, David Deutsch figured out was, well, you know, you can have a quantum superposition of uh, these bits so that you could have a bit that could be on or off, that's the A part, and then you would have a B part, you'd have a mulligan, you'd have a second chance, and then you could say, well, you have the B part can also be on and off. So therefore you have a bistable device in, that actually superimposed. Now what that means is you can actually string these together and suddenly the numbers start going exponential. 
So it works something like this. Basically, a normal JK flip-flop, the elementary unit uh, that gives us the bit, I can have two states, 0 or 1. And you can string them together and have 0 or 1 and 0 or 1. And then you can do counting. You can count up from 0, 0, 1. 0, 1, 0, which is 2. 0, 1, 1, 3. And carry on all the way up to 7, give you 3 bits. So, okay, that's how the normal computer works. Now imagine you have a qubit. Now you have A, the A component of this bit, and that can be 0 or 1. And then you've got a second chance. You've got B, and now that can also be 0, 1. So the qubit then has more options. You have a combination. You could have 0 and 0, 0 and 1, you could have 1 and 0, and you can have 1 and 1. So suddenly now you've got a lot of extra states that you can have in a qubit. But now, what happens when you string them together? Now you get an exponential explosion of the combinatorics between these two. And that's the exciting part of quantum computing and why people start to realize that, well, no, you've got all these states multiplied by these, multiplied by these, and pretty soon, when you have 64 of them in a row, you've, got, you've been able to represent a fantastically big number. But by the same token, look at the multimodal neural net. You've got a neural net here, and each one of these neural nodes, say, can now have a fantastic amount of combinations. So this can be either on or off, and then basically be based on all the emotions you can think of that are represented by your neurotransmitter. Some neurotransmitter in the brain and uh, has some source that actually emits it. Your brain is sitting in a stew of these uh, neurotransmitters, which makes for a chemical soup, and that chemical soup is the uh, essentially the analog part that underlines these essentially digital neurons. Now, neurons, neuroscientists tend to think of them as digital because they fire, the synapses fire, and they seem to be either firing or not firing, and they're very used to the sound of the clicks of these neural uh, firings. But what they forget is they're firing in a soup of these immense uh, amount of combinations that you can have in terms of the other neural transmitters that are really the analog part that backs up this digital circuit. And have a look what happens. Say even if you had seven different states, you have the combinatorics of seven different states just there, multiplied by seven here, multiplied by seven again, and very soon you start to see that you far outrunning even a quantum computer. And the differences don't even end there, because there's also the question of anchoring. Artificial intelligence is normally just in the abstract. It just basically has input and an output, and the model, interior model, is just in the abstract. It's just floating in the ether. It's not actually grounded in any physical reality. We have a kind of embodied experience. And so we also have the added complication that we have this egocentric point of view and an allocentric point of view at the same time. We have what's called mirror neurons and a theory of mind. So inside our minds we also have a model of the minds of the people around us. And even the actions that they do and things that they say, uh, we have neurons that are actually mimicking them internally. And so all of that would actually have to be recreated in an artificially intelligent brain. So it would need exponentially more power than it already has because it would have to embody the exponential power of all the machines and intelligent entities around it. 
something that's not liable to happen, even though people like Elon Musk imagines that you can just scale out warehouses in this unimodal framework digital architecture. You'll only get so far with that unless you start going down the paths of iteration recursion and stuff that I've been explaining in this multimodality. And now what about the eternal issue of the robots taking over? Do we become pets for androids? So the, so far below them in intelligence that it would be would be like you know, a pet, basically. Pet, that's what I was like a pet. cat. Like a cat. cat. Like a cat. Elon It'd be like the a house cat. cat. Yeah, right. it would be like the house cat. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. Should be very careful about artificial intelligence. Um, if I were to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. Even uh, Lovelock at 99 years old came out recently and said that we're destined to be the pets of artificial intelligent beings. It's nonsense. It's absolutely nonsense. It's just linear thinking alien cortexes that extrapolate forward in this kind of IQ test digital thinking and assume that it just carries on exponentially on some kind of Moore's law or something and then suddenly you have super intelligence and it's nothing of the sort. Humans who are limited by slow biological evolution couldn't compete and would be superseded. I must say I'm a little bit surprised at Stephen Hawking because I thought he was a little bit smarter than that. He must surely know the second law of thermodynamics and know that what he's proposing is a perpetual motion machine. It's an impossibility. It's a physical impossibility. If you had machines that could manufacture other machines, they would have to do it without error. And that's not possible according to the second law of thermodynamics. As they made copies of themselves, it would be like a photocopy of a photocopy. It would degenerate. And there's no way they could actually uh, correct the degeneration. That would be a Maxwell demon. And everybody knew since the 19th century that that is actually a physical impossibility. And it's to do with Boltzmann equation and Boltzmann entropy. And the combination of things that can go wrong are exponentially bigger than the possible ordered ways that you might get lucky and they go right. And that's pretty much the second law of thermodynamics. The way to think about it is imagine if you have say a system that's minimally complex and it does something like you know creates iPads or icons or whatever it does it uh, it creates computers now imagine that manufacturing machine has to actually get some maintenance or it needs to be fixed it couldn't be self-healing remember Gödel's theorem and the consistency it can't actually prove itself would actually be healed so it can't actually be self-healing, that's an impossibility. So let's just say it had another machine that healed it. Now that machine has to be exponentially more complex because it has to see all the modes of failure of the first machine and it also has to be able to correct them. Being more complex, who maintains the more complex machine? You have this infinite regress of ever-expanding complexity, which is exactly what Boltzmann was saying. I must say that I really am rather amazed at the kind of crap that Stephen Hawking used to come up with about AI. I often used to think that maybe his voice synthesizer had taken on a life of its own and was saying all this crap on his behalf and inside he was going, no, no, don't listen to it. Machines can't take over. It's talking absolute crap, except in this one case. Hmm. The machines can't take over relax. If they could, it would be a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. They really are like wind-up toys. And no matter how many armies of them you get, they would, for example, get, say, difficulties with their ball bearings. And they probably wouldn't have the creativity to create a ball bearing factory. And even if they did, they would probably run out of ball bearings before they could get that factory going again. So we really don't have to worry about the robots taking over. What we do have to worry about is the digital thinking billionaires who think everybody are just drones and robots 
and they have already taken over. So you should fear AI. You should fear it because some billionaire will deploy it to take away your job. And the only way out is to get rid of billionaires and find another way that we get income other than from work. Let the machines do the work, we just do the maintenance of the machines and then pretty much we can get rid of this exploitational system that is really turning us all into digital thinking drones. We're becoming the pets of billionaires, not the pets of machines. But better still, it's time to deindustrialize and not rely on the machines. Because there's no way that artificial intelligence will get to the technological singularity before industrialization itself overruns us and the ecosystem collapses. We support the machines and we need food. Food security is going to crap while we pursue machines. So long before we get to be the slaves of the AI, or we become AI's pets, or we have an existential threat from artificial intelligence, we will get to the point where the billionaires' companies erode because of food security concerns, because of environmental collapse, because of societal collapse. It's inconceivable that billionaires like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and these other criminals are still around with their fiat money fortunes intact, developing artificial intelligence to the point that it becomes a threat to humanity. We'll be overwhelmed by the environmental and climatological catastrophe based on industrialization of the companies that these criminal psychopaths run. And now Elon Musk's company Neuralink has announced that it's created a brain-computer interface. It's surgically implanted in your head and can connect about a thousand neurons. Apparently in tests a monkey has been able to control a robot using this device. If a robot can be controlled by a monkey that way, then my conclusion is that if you get a job from Elon Musk, Part of the job requirement will be that he controls you using this device. Binary solo. Come on, Sakura, lake my battery.